What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged, and we like to get scared together. Mm-hmm. And today we're going to talk about something that scares everybody little kids (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah or more broadly i guess children not just little kids i guess oh they can be uh tweens yeah if you will Mm -hmm. or adolescents yeah it turns out kids and horror is a very broad topic Mm -hmm. it's a very big topic and just like in real life everyone's got opinions about kids Mm -hmm. and how to raise kids everyone has opinions about them in horror it turns out yeah, but nobody ever yells at uh, filmmakers if they don't feel like having kids in their movie. That's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, lots of stuff out there about kids in horror. This has been a much requested topic. Lots of emails about this one. And this was a big undertaking. I didn't yeah, think it was going to be this much. I've uh, lost my fiance to the work that she's been putting in to this episode over the past a couple of weeks now. I've been right? working on it for a few weeks. You've yeah. been hunched over that desk, just reading books upon books upon books, just yeah. typing away. Like, this is a, a stack. Because the thing, okay, the thing about trying stack to learn notes. about childhood in general and like the idea of what kids even are, what that means to people throughout history and other cultures, it's just. Everything affects everything. This is one of those topics where once you get into it, it's so intertwined with historical events. And it's just you set off a domino effect trying to learn about this stuff. I see on page uh, eight or around there, we get into Japan's economy stagnating in the 90s. Yeah. All right. So that's where we're going. (laughs) That's why this one's probably going to be a Mm two-parter. It's hard to say for sure because we haven't recorded it. But it's probably going to be a two-parter. Yeah. It's just so much. But I just figured, like, I'd rather have this be a a good deep dive instead of just, let's talk about the top 10 scariest kids. Yeah. And I definitely had to get into international cinema because other countries besides America are really into creepy kids. I will have you know that now we're going to have tons of comments asking us to rank the top 10 scariest kids. There's so many scary kids. And that's another <laughs> Top thing. Top 10, go. Top 10, go. I mean, obviously, Damien's somewhere up there because he has to be. Yeah. Reagan. Are we going to hear about Damien and Reagan in this episode? We'll talk about Damien and Reagan. Here's the thing, though, is because there are so many. Sorry, I'm not going to finish that top 10 list. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's so many creepy kids in horror. And I even asked on Twitter who are your favorites who should i definitely talk about and it's just i can't talk about all of them Mm -hmm. there's gonna be ones i don't mention there's gonna be ones that i seemingly gloss over it's just because there's so much to talk about and i'm gonna be talking more um we'll talk some movies in detail but more specifically it's gonna be like eras of horror or subgenres of horror and not just specific movies necessarily okay. although there are some we're gonna get into some like analysis cool we're gonna talk a lot about the shining i think so great mm-hmm. uh yeah i before i get started to a lot of my actually like all of my research for this was taken from different academic journals different books all of this work because again talking about kids gonna inevitably get into some psychoanalytic stuff that it's just like super academic I could not have come up with the theories in this and the research in this just on my own people worked very hard on compiling these theories compiling these histories so I'm just gonna real quick go through the sources I used for this because this episode is like drawn from these I did not like pull this out of thin air so we've got the uh evil child or Evil Children in Film and Literature by Karen J. Renner, which is like, it's an academic, it's like a compilation of essays. So it's got an essay from her that I use, and it's also got a essay by Stefan Henke, an essay by William Wanless, and one by A. Robin Hoffman. We have The Monster Show by David J. Skull. If you take 
any classes on horror in film school or otherwise, you're probably going to read this book. I feel like it's a pretty, it's really readable too. This is not a dense theory book. This is more history. So if you're into like what's going on in horror during Vietnam kind of stuff, this is the book for you. That's always fun. Yeah, it's great. Um, We have The Uncanny Child in Transnational Cinema by Jessica Balan Zetigui. Alonza Tegui, I'm so I just I have never I haven't said her name out loud until this point. The second one sounded pretty good. Yeah, that it the, her this book, which is available online for free, which oh. I think is incredible because it just it's like open source. She is a professor, but this book is so much of my research, so I have to give such props to it. I just I found it and I downloaded it and I spent days reading her book because it's so <laughs> dense. Just downloaded it into your brain. Yeah, I think with, if I hadn't found her book, we would not be spending most of possibly an entire episode if this is two parts talking about Spanish horror and Japanese horror. Oh, cool. Yes. And that's something that I know a lot of people have wanted yes. us to talk about. So, so there you go. If you're into that, if you, I'll, I'll, I'll put the link to the download for this because again, it is open source. So check it out. She's on Twitter. Tweet at her and say her work is really cool and good because <laughs> it is. So, uh, all right. I, I have more specific links below to like essays and stuff. Okay. Here we go. So evil kids after all that intro. <laughs> it's just very loaded. Uh, they, I think they're, they're so universally unsettling because making a kid evil is an ethical quandary, right? Yeah, because usually you want to snuff out evil. And what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Snuff out a kid? Right, we're kind of hardwired <laughs> to, not even if we're, you know, we don't want to, protect children if we we kind of argue like oh evolutionarily we want to like protect kids mm-hmm. but even if you don't like kids it's still weird to have an evil kid well it's the whole they're associated with innocence you yes know? exactly it's- they're kind of positioned as they're the other of adults children are innocent adults are not adults have lived their lives and have therefore at some point done something that's wrong even if a kid does something wrong they're a kid yeah right and so it, they also kind of force us to question one of life's big debates, one of history's biggest debates. Are we born evil or are we made that way? Ooh, by the time this episode comes out, I'll have released the kill count for the witch. And that's a huge topic in that movie. Oh, okay. We should, because there's creepy kids in that too. There so are, we, yeah. we should talk about the witch because I don't really have anything about the witch in well, I here. I can talk all day about the witch. Yeah, sure, sure. But I feel like... <laughs> I took like one philosophy class in college. I took basically philosophy 101, but that is like, I feel like you get into philosophy 101 and you're talking about, are we born evil or are (laughs) we made? That's just, that's like the philosophical question. Good deontological arguments there. Yeah, exactly. And I I nearly minored in philosophy before I ran out of money to get the last few credits I needed. Yeah. I double majored. Yeah. It was enough. That's a lot. (laughs) (laughs) But answers to this question are always changing, ever shifting, and the fiction we make about evil kids, particularly the horror movies that we make about evil kids, kind of reflect how we as a society are feeling about that one way or the other. Evil kids is like a storytelling thing, though, or as characters that we, as we know them, are pretty contemporary. We see a rise in them in like the 1950s, like mid 20th century ish, although there are some exceptions. Like you just reread Turn of the Screw. I try to okay yeah it's uh it's one of those books that's written in the like just these long clauses upon clauses upon clauses for the sentences and so you know it's been a real rough month i would lay in bed at two in the morning after working all day and be like all right let's read and it's like i just lose myself throughout so it's a very short book uh i recommend people read it because i loved it when i read it before and haunting of hill house's next season is going to be based on it but i did not have a chance to review it for this episode i'm sorry dear that's okay <laughs> but I, I i'm sure that that next season of hill house because turn of the screw does t- you know tangle with the idea are we born evil or not because what it's the staff in the turn of the screw that is possibly influencing these kids i'm not i'm not super familiar with it unfortunately i I haven't read it yeah fell out my brain yeah yeah. but uh so that story this earlier kind of creepy kid story we do see some like 
outside influence makes kids okay bad or because that's like late 19th century that's it i I just checked it's 1898 okay yeah is when that came out but as we move to the 1950s we have stories about evil kids coming out with regularity at this Mm -hmm. point and these are kids that are born bad Okay, they're not being directed by adults to no, do their bidding. No, these are evil children, and they are born that way. And the 1950s, I don't think it's a coincidence, we also see the nuclear family becoming the prominent style of family. We take that for granted now. So, you know, your nuclear family is your mom, your dad, or your dad, dad, mom. But 1950s is mom and dad. Yeah. <laughs> we have the mom and dad and the kids. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, and, and uh, that's excluding, like, grandparents who, in previous times, would have been closer and, like, lived with right. the family. Yeah. It is a very new thing that we isolate ourselves into these tiny families. Mm-hmm. The nuclear family is there to raise a future functional adult, especially because you also think of the 1950s. It's all about the workforce. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, how are kids going to fit into the future of especially America? We're going to be talking mostly about America in this episode. But it's, yeah, how does your future child become a future productive adult who produces things for our economy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in uh, 1953, we have the short story, It's a Good Life, written by Jerome Bixby. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's also a very famous Twilight Zone episode. And that eventual segment in the movie done by Joe Dante. And I went and watched, I rewatched both of them for the oh, podcast. Okay. Yeah. That Twilight Zone episode is like, that. that's such a classic one. That's like in the, I feel like most, one of the most recognizable, um, if not images, kind of quotes or like, you know, does that, does it ring a bell at all for you? Uh, what like imagery or quotes you're talking about yeah so the the it's a good life is about this kid named anthony who he has supernatural powers he's six years old by the way he's a little kid he can read minds and so you always have to think good thoughts around him and you all the adults say oh it's very good you did that anthony it's very very good that's why it's called it's a good life Mm. so it's all these adults just like crapping their pants trying not (laughs) to think bad thoughts around this six-year-old uh the kid anthony before we jump into the twilight zone rod serling explains that this this kid has wiped away everything else on the planet except his tiny little town. His <laughs> tiny town is the only thing that exists. And he is this like monster dictator of this little town. Oh, wow. And so they it's someone who lives in the town's birthday. And so they're having this shitty ass birthday party for him. That is just how this little kid Anthony wants it to be. And this guy has a psychotic break because he gets a Perry Como record for his birthday. And he can't listen to it because Anthony doesn't like Perry Como. I can't even play my own record. I can't even play Perry Como. But when when Anthony doesn't like someone, he banishes them out into this cornfield, never Ooh, to be seen again. Or he field. or he does some like weird body horror to them, which we don't really see in the Twilight Zone episode because budget. Sure. We're going to talk about the 1983 version, by the way, when we get into the 80s, because I think the changes made to it reflect the mm-hmm. differences we're going to talk about in between like... 1950s creepy kids and then 1980s creepy kids there's different things going on then we have the bad seed in 1954 it's when the novel comes out and the 1956 film and the title the bad seed implies this kid's born evil and it is revealed that the girl's grandmother in this story of uh, rhoda uh her grandmother was a serial killer and then Therefore, her evil is genetic. Ah. And the girl in this, by the way, beats a boy to death with tap shoes because she lost a penmanship contest to him, along with some other murders. But that one, like, really stuck out to me. Wow. That's brutal. Yeah, but I'd rather them be connected. I'd rather she stab the kid with a pen because she lost the penmanship Mm. contest, you know. Getting beaten to death with tap shoes. Well, then have her then the next scene lose a dance competition (laughs) and then she can tap all over the little kid's corpse. Yeah. So these kind of reflect this fear of kids being born evil. And I kind of think it's maybe anxiety over this new emphasis on child rearing as a nuclear family because it's very isolated and maybe adjusting to this really new isolated style of child rearing. I can't I could imagine that you would feel really trapped. You would feel like you don't have a lifeline because with an extended family you do. You have like they say it takes a village. You have other people to help you with your kids. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if maybe that's part of why we get born evil kids. Maybe the idea of you're stuck in this tiny family with no help and then you have an evil kid and then what? <laughs> what do you do? There's nowhere to go. 
Then on May 11th, 1960, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approves the prescription birth control pill. Yeah. Here we go. The pill changes sexuality drastically, and it's a crucial part of the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s. This changes so much. <laughs> the pill, the magic pill, I feel like some people, I don't know if people still call it. That sounds Was so dated. Was it called the magic pill? I think as a nickname, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. It sounds very mad men to me mm, the, yeah. man, the magic pill mm. but in 1968 british scientists find a link between the pill and potentially fatal blood clotting that is still actually an issue with some forms of birth control i know before i was put on birth control as a teen uh i had to take a blood test to see if i had a genetic predisposition to blood clotting because oh. yeah so i can't imagine back then with like the crazy high levels of hormones how often women were getting blood clots from the pill that would have been really fucking scary in the 70s the hormones are lowered in the european versions of the pill but the high hormone level pills aren't banned in america until 1988 oh that's what you meant by high hormones i thought you like i thought maybe the 60s were an especially horny time for some reason oh <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> hormone I like, levels yeah are i was high. like what why did they have higher no, hormones? no 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 <laughs> the pill literally had more JFK hormones in it on everyone's tv yeah getting everyone horny yeah man uh <laughs> I, apparently, some American scientists even lost funding after they challenged the pill safety, which mm. when you think about it, it makes sense. You have apparently the, the science or just the, the process of making the pill was kind of rushed because they knew we're going to make so much fucking money. Sure. We invent the pill that keeps women from getting pregnant. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, they pushed that out as soon as they could. So they overlook a lot of the potential mm. side effects of it. And of course, most of the scientists who worked on the invention of the pill were male. And I, I point that out because in this era, we have this kind of anxiety over this really potent combination of men and science controlling the realm of sex and reproduction. And so you get stuff like Village of the Damned. There's nothing you can do to stop us. Leave us alone. 1960, you gotta mention Village of the Damned. You're talking about creepy kids where sex is divorced from reproduction. And that's what the pill does, right? It takes, you can just have sex and not have to worry about having children. You are literally divorcing the idea of sex from reproducing sex is now its own thing Mm -hmm. and so that's what you've got in this movie you've got british women becoming pregnant by a force from outer space and they give birth to a bunch of really creepy blonde blue-eyed kids who have psychic powers not only is there now anxiety over reproduction being tied to science there's anxiety in having to trust the men at this time who are creating this pill and creating these medications and telling you that it's safe think of rosemary's baby i think that's a perfect connection for this this anxiety and this fear in this movie you have rosemary who gets pregnant via demon rape and she has no choice but to trust her neighbors who are like the best part of them <laughs> she has no choice but to trust her neighbors who are giving her this fucking gross ass tannis like it looks like it it's looks so like ranch gross. dressing yeah. in a cup it's so fucking gross it, yeah. she looks like she's chugging ranch dressing that whole movie and i hate it uh but they have her drink this tannis root drink and everyone around her insists you know what we're putting in your body is good for you we're, you know we have you we have our best intentions like where you're good you're gonna be fine and got that doctor who like you put your last ounce of hope in yes. to just not be a bad guy yeah and, fucking... and that's the fear right that yeah. you that your doctor you think you can trust your doctor but ultimately the doctor is also going to give you something that's harming you in the long run mm. so i think that's a perfect movie to demonstrate the fear that's going on at this time Uh, About two years after the pill's release as well, another medication meant for women is revealed to have devastating consequences. A hypnotic, as the doctors call it, that was the answer to a prayer. Its generic name was thalidomide. This is around 10,000 babies affected. If taken during the first trimester, uh, I guess it could cause babies to be born without arms or legs or with short flippers. If you've ever heard the term flipper baby, oh yeah, that's what this is. People around the whole world are fascinated by 
this case, all these cases. And is it localized to any country? No, this is around the whole world. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it, it gets to like a morbid sort of fascination too. We have pictures of these babies with birth defects on tabloids with sensational titles like New Thalamine Monsters. Philippa Bradbourne is one example. Her mother rejected her. Ten-year-old Carl Davies leads a relatively normal life for a boy without arms. One other young mother, her husband, her sister, and her doctor are charged with the mercy killing of her deformed infant. By the way, uh, in the monster show by David J. Skull, he points out that it's this exact time period where Todd Browning's Freaks becomes really popular again. Oh, okay. Because, yes. yeah, that did al already make me think of that. Yep. So there is, in general, just a rise in books and films that are meant to make the reader and viewer anxious about the ideas of parenthood. And to add to that, in 1965, there's this really famous photo essay in Life magazine by Leonard Nilsson. Wilson. On the cover of Life, there's this 18-week-old fetus, and there's a photo spread in Life of the fetus throughout development. You've probably seen these pictures before, even if you don't know specifically what I'm talking about. I feel like these are, you know how like we take one picture of the moon, and so that's just the picture everyone knows of the moon. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is like that, or it's like these are pictures of fetuses that we just have and use everywhere because okay. this was such a big deal. This type of photography was like no one had seen anything like it before. Um, Were these like fetuses uh, out of the womb or like... <laughs> I guess partially. I think that I was getting into some of the controversy. This is why this episode took me so fucking long because I was reading about that guy's photo spread and I guess like some of it was in utero, but a lot of it was like fetuses outside the womb and like manipulated to look like they would look in the womb. It was all really and weird. And like were those from abortions? I or? think so. Okay. Hmm. I'm not 100% sure, but Yeah. So a lot of it was like staged to look like this is what it would look like. Got it. Yeah. Um. So then, yeah, it, that's nineteen. That photo spread is nineteen sixty five. So again, nineteen sixty seven. Ira Levin writes Rosemary's Baby. So not only is she not controlling her conception, again we have the creepy neighbors giving her tannis root and. It, on top of her body being controlled by other people and having to place her trust in other people, there's just the sheer horror of her baby being born a monster. Which it is. Yep. Spoiler. A uh, has his father's eyes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. This era, by the way, this time period, we've got not only Rosemary's Baby, but The Exorcist and The Omen. There they are. And these all come out right around the same time, which is interesting. Again, you, you realize there's such anxiety over kids at this specific time. And of course, we're going to get these horror movies. It makes complete sense. And these are also the three films that are credited with making horror broadly appealing and good. Think about all three of those movies. Like exorcist is nominated for oscars yes and all three of these are like they're critical darlings these are three good quote-unquote legitimate horror is what they would have called it true they... cinema exactly scorsese would scorsese. even like them <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you want to talk about our sponsor real quick? Dave. <laughs> Dave? Not Dave Dave, our friend Dave. Oh, not Drunk Disney Dave? Not Drunk Disney oh, Dave. Oh, <laughs> damn, I miss him. <laughs> I know, I miss him too. No, Dave isn't sponsoring our our show. It's the Dave app. It's a financial planning app. And the reason I love this is because it prevents you from overdrawing your account. Oh, yeah amazing for sure like we all need that because we've all overdrawn our account we've all been there and man we've all paid like 30 some dollars i for think mcdonald's during fries. my college years <laughs> i probably spent more on overdraft fees than so anything much. else yeah that was my top line of the budget yeah i oh man like until embarrassingly recently i've had overdraft fees yeah it, it sucks, sucks. <laughs> it's it's like one of the most humiliating things that can happen to you as an adult i'm pretty sure mm -hmm. um but this is a budgeting app that makes sure that that doesn't happen it'll tell you about upcoming bills and it can advance you 75 bucks from your next paycheck with no credit check and no interest which Whoa. is why payday loans are a scam don't, don't do, do those. them get day this is not this <laughs> <laughs> this is like not uh, a scam. Yeah. There's not a predatory lending thing, I promise. One of those just bright yellow banners in the storefronts. Yeah. yeah. Don't do those. They're <laughs> bad. Uh, get the Dave app and for just a dollar a month, and that's $12 a year because there's 12 months in a year. That's math. Uh, you uh, 
That's less than an overdraft fee, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it is. You'll never have to pay one ever again. Dave can help you budget for upcoming expenses. It'll let you know if you're spending too much. Um, I guess Mark Cuban, the Shark Tank guy. Oh. He uh, invested in this because he got messed up real bad by overdraft fees in his 20s. And he was like, yeah. Let's I get not it. do that. Yeah. <laughs> Even Mark Cuban can relate. It's the number one budgeting app in the app store, by the way. Oh, nice. I did. Like, I, I checked this out because I always look up things that we sponsor. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay, this has good. Like, you can always tell right away first glance, like financial apps, it's 50-50 on whether or not they're trustworthy or not. This one, like, solid. Nice. Spelled just like Dave. Just, just D- like our buddy. D-A-V-E. Overdraft fees, more like no overdraft fees. They wrote it. I love it. I want to say it. Because of the success of Rosemary's Baby, specifically the 70s and early 80s, see tons of fictional evil kids and not even just in horror. Uh, by the way, Newsweek at the time, I, I tried to find the actual article this was from. I believe the citation, though, it's from one of the books I was reading. It's a legit source, but I wanted I just wanted to see it for myself. There's a Newsweek article in 1976 that is talking about anti-child sentiment and this concern over it. And they conduct a poll of 10,000 mothers and 70 percent say they would opt not to have children if they were given the choice to go back wow yeah that's, 70 percent that would wreak havoc on the population yeah wow i wanted to i know i was like i just want to see it for myself well and and during this time i'm just trying to do the math this would be generation x being born right yes which is a smaller generation it is a smaller than gen- yes both the boomers who came before them and us the millennials yep. who came after them so. exactly huh. yeah interesting i wonder if Cold War is why I that probably too because Factors everyone's in. like we're all gonna die mm-hmm. yeah interesting and yeah 1970s this is when we have all of our horror writers coming to prominent like all the household names household name horror writers we have Dean Koontz who writes Demon Seed which was made into a movie in 77 with Julie Christie she is impregnated by a computer in that story oh yeah is it an evil computer I believe it is an evil computer. Because that yes. could be a really nice story. That could know? be a really beautiful just, romance, yeah. but I don't just think my, it is. My computer husband. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Anne Rice, Interview with a Vampire, 76. We have the creepy uh, Claudia in that story, Kirsten Dunst from the movie. Okay, I, I've not read the book or seen the movie. I didn't know there was a creepy kid I in it. I swear we watched that together. Did we? I feel like we did. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen King, who uh, specializes in creepy kids. Oh, yeah. yeah. Carrie in 74, who I count as a creepy kid. She's a minor. Uh, <laughs> Children of the Corn, 77. The, the Shining in 77. Firestarter in 1980. And Pet Cemetery in 1983. He's just churning them, churning them out. Yes. The It's worth pointing out, too, that in the mid-1950s, which is when we start talking about our modern day creepy kid. That's when we first get the ultrasound used in a pregnancy, but it becomes wide use during the seventies, this decade we're talking about now. So it's another like on top of, we've got new pictures on life magazine of look at what your, the fetus looks like while it's inside of you. And then we have ultrasounds where now women are going to the hospital. It's like, look at this thing in you. Yeah. You don't, you don't really think you about take it for granted now, but this must've all been really freaky and really fast. Yeah. To just see the kid yeah. in you. That's yeah. And just, we're going to pile some more crap on the seventies sure, here. It it's a very fraught decade. Roe v. Wade, <laughs> 1973, Ooh. the first test to baby, 1978. Hey, beautiful normal girl. It's the first known baby conceived outside its mother's womb. And by the way, I, I think this stuff is all worth mentioning because it feeds into the anxiety over kids that we see depicted in film, but uh, it also opens up the door into fear of birth and fear of reproduction, which I think is its own thing that's its own corner of horror theory there's so much work about the fear of like the birth process yes or, the okay. birth process and growing a child that's that's gonna oh, open see. the doors to alien, alien yep. and body horror cronenberg it, it's sure. just like nope too much it, i was like that's where you had to shut, you the know, <laughs> shut it down it's too much <laughs> it's a lot of like really Freudian shit. It's like, no, we're, we're shutting it down. It's Fair very enough. good, fun stuff to talk about. But so I'm not going to include scary birth films, which I count. It's alive, I feel like, as a scary because you don't really see the kid. Oh, no. Yeah. It's, it. 
<laughs> Although, yeah, those films are all playing with the same anxieties that our creepy kid films are. You know, contrary to evil kids in It's a Good Life, Anthony, who's just like an evil piece of shit. He, there's like nothing redeeming about him. He's just creepy. Yeah, that's the evil dictator kid from the Twilight Zone episode. Mm-hmm, yeah, okay. that was very good. You did that, Anthony. <laughs> we've got our possessed kid and we've got our feral child. Oh, okay. These kids are a bit more ambiguous. Which might not sound so at first, because possessed sounds pretty evil and feral sounds pretty crazy, too. Well, with, well, with both of those, I can see an aspect of it not being the kid's fault. Because exactly. possessed, they're being possessed by something else that's controlling them and making them evil. And then feral, it's like they never learned otherwise. Exactly. Okay. Right, exactly. Yeah, so if they're born evil at all, it's made clear that the reason is something beyond their control but you know 70s still has plenty of pure evil kids we've got damien he's like damien's just evil yeah. like, he's the antichrist <laughs> like no two bones about he's just the <laughs> antichrist but my point here is that it's worth noting in this kind of uptick in characters that deviate from that earlier model of this kid is born evil yeah okay yeah so the horror of possessed kids, by the way, comes from often suggestive behavior. And that's why we see girls getting possessed. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Carol Clover actually points that out in her book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, that the possessed is often female. Possessed kids are also vulnerable due to the breakdown of the family. So they kind of possibly symbolize fear of bad parenting, even letting kids be influenced by violent Movies, music, games. Hanging out with the wrong crowd. Yeah, exactly. So we've got Satan or a demon is often the culprit. Exorcist. Yeah. Pazuzu, Mm -hmm. yeah. Former humans are often the culprit as well. And I put some modern examples in here because I just think that they're great. Uh, Charles Lee Ray is a perfect example. He's a human trying to ultimately possess a little kid. Mm-hmm. I think people forget that he he does not want to be Chucky. Well, not until C. Sure, yeah, yeah, When yeah. he decides, fuck, fuck it, it yeah. I'm a killer doll. But yeah, he spends that first trilogy Andy. really trying to get into Andy's body. Yeah, and the prodigy is this too, if you did not see the prodigy. Yeah, mm-hmm. that which... Is a great, I liked the prodigy. It's, it's got some fun. great fucking scares, dude. Yeah, but this is so in in all these cases, this is the supernatural possessing a kid to make them act uncharacteristically. Captain who? Captain Howdy. Who's Captain Howdy? You know, I make the questions and he does the answers. So possessions when kids are involved are like this kind of parental crisis because it's. When you look at them this way, they become these cautionary tales of dangerous influences and negligence. And this is what happens when you don't take care of your kid. And again, that's often why we have possessed girls and possessed girls that are sexual. Because that's, you know... Like Reagan. Yeah, exactly. Because Reagan is masturbating with the crucifix and the exorcist. And Mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable to watch, but that's on purpose. And... But that's one of, we're told as a society and like we're told as as parents that one of our biggest fears as parents is, oh, our, if we have a girl, that they're going to be a sexual being someday, yeah. right? That's like one, you know, that's why there's the stupid idea of the dad with the shotgun and it sucks. But yeah. <laughs> that is the thing we culturally really fear. So like, let's look at the exorcist. We have Reagan's parents are divorced. And as we're moving through the 20th century, higher rates of divorce every decade. Um, Except now, I think, didn't they go down? Yeah. Yeah. I think because of us, millennials. Millennials. What up? We wait longer and don't get divorced Yay. as much. But yeah, like 70s, 80s, not, it's like just going up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Reagan's dad doesn't call her on her birthday. Reagan's often left unsupervised. Like it's implied while her mom is at work because her mom's making an actress. Movies, yeah. What movie is it that she's making? A guy? I feel like we it's always think like it's funny. Yeah, it's thing. like an yeah. activism. Uh, yeah, we just yeah, always. She's like outside a courthouse. I forget For what. some reason, it's always so funny to us whenever <laughs> it comes up because it's so weird. I just always forget that that's a thing in that movie. Yeah. So, but uh, Reagan befriends Captain Howdy and then all the fault, even though you have this dad who is not in the picture and clearly isn't trying, the fault is still all with the mom in this movie. Reagan or Pazuzu is taunting her and isn't mentioning dad at all. He's Mm -hmm. not bringing him up. And the mom in the end ultimately has to be the one to adjust her life to save Reagan. But yeah, this all this all implies that possession is preventable, and we have this fear of the collapse of the stable family. So then we move to our feral kid, who 
at first, it's weird because at first I was like, oh, I'm not as interested in the feral kid. The feral kid is always going to be just part of a group. They're not really a character. That's why I have them listed as like cannibal, zombie, vampire. Yeah. they're Is, is that like children of the corn? Are they feral kids? Yes. Yeah, so they're counted as feral kids in this essay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we don't really have sympathy for them as a character. Be- uh, and so it's easier for us to kind of want their demise or root for their demise too, <laughs> which, okay. It makes them a little fun <laughs> and they're, but their mindless savagery kind of reminds us of our capability of it too. Mm. Throughout history though, it's interesting to kind of note that there's all these tales of feral kids raised by kind animals. This is like in like throughout mythology. So like basically throughout human storytelling, I feel like there's always been this kind of idea of like this child of nature being raised yeah raised by a pack of wolves yeah that's like remus and romulus who like supposedly founded rome is like raised by a wolf that's why if you ever go to rome there's always pictures of like a wolf with like big old teats and these little (laughs) babies like sucking on oh yeah yeah it's remus and romulus they founded rome (laughs) but we also have more modern examples are like mowgli and tarzan or like noble noble savage is what they are they're like pure nature like ralph waldo emerson would love this idea of the natural child and shit but you know in real life actual feral children are, are always really sad cases of child abuse and neglect oh like mama Mama, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because they're like they're uh, little feral kids. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, uh, someone I I believe tweeted at me when I asked for like, who, what should I talk about in this kids episode? They mentioned Jeannie, the like most famous feral child case ever. Have you had you heard of this before? Uh, maybe at one point, but I don't remember now. She was a little girl who like for God, I think she was. They found her when she was like six no older than that but like for the first however many years of her life she lived in like one room and had like no anything when was this oh i forget like 70s 80s maybe yeah but so yeah real life feral kids uh we wouldn't consider them evil at all (laughs) they're like really sad cases of child abuse yeah um especially because those are the you know those are such important developmental years that mm. it, there's some aspect of, and I'm sure that's why it's used in movies, is like I, there's a point of almost no return where like if you find a kid who's 10 years old and didn't spend those first 10 years socializing and learning what it's like to be a human, how do you fix that? Right. You know? Right. And that's why Jeannie, a, a big thing with her was like she scientists were like, oh man, we got to find a way to research this kid because how we can't make that happen. Yeah, you it's, can't control you can't, a uh, yeah. experiment like that. Right, exactly. It's mm. all very, very sad. Uh, but in, in horror movies, feral kids, these kids who haven't been civilized are monsters. And, and an actual, like a feral kid on their own isn't very scary, which is why they're always in a group. Mm. Um, but I feel like a perfect feral kid example is Karen in Night of the Living Dead, who goes and kills her parents with a, is it a it's not a garden trowel. It's a, a mason's tool. I yeah. forget what it's called. The thing you spread the stuff on a brick. A spa- spackle? I don't a know. Spatula. <laughs> yep. We We're know how masons. to build stuff. Yep. <laughs> We're real property brothers. <laughs> <laughs> but often the motivation for these kids being feral is they're hungry. That's why we make them vampires or cannibals or zombies as they're just driven by hunger. Yeah, It's like that makes raw sense. primal thing. Mm-hmm. Just the base level need yes, for someone. Exactly. Other motivations that we give our animalistic kids besides hunger is a disease or a mysterious event. So who can kill a child in 1976? Which, by the way... What's the name of a yes, movie? I watched this movie in college and for years i'm not even kidding i only remembered it when someone it might have been i'm trying to remember who tweeted it at me but it just like snapped i was like oh my god that's it because we watched this movie in college and for years the imagery of it i like knew it existed but every time i tried googling it i would get village of the damned or something and i'm like no it's not that it's something else and i can't like 
because all I could remember was like a boat and creepy kids all looking out windows and stuff. But it's this movie, the Spanish horror movie, 1976, Who Can Kill a Child, which we're going to talk about more later because it's a Spanish horror movie and it's super important. But in that, there's no reason given for these kids killing adults on the islands, but they are contagious to other kids. We get the implication that there's something making them like this, but we don't know what. Huh. Yeah. And that's kind of what's creepy about it is it's like, well, how are they getting other kids to join in? It's so weird. Does the movie ever answer the question? Nope. Doesn't answer who can kill a kid? Uh, this twi- uh, the answer to that is adults can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when feral kids in movies are given more intelligence, like you mentioned Children of the Corn, mm-hmm. they aren't just like a mindless horde. They're still a big group, though, and they're like kind of developmentally weird, I think, because it's like kids raising kids kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're often members, in this case, of a backwards religion. So in that, it's no one over the age of 18 is allowed to live. Yeah. And when they turn 19, they are given to he, he who walks, walks behind, behind the, the rose. rose. And there's also feral kids from inbred families. So Sonny Bean, we talked about Sonny Bean in like one of our first podca- uh, podcast episodes. Yeah. Yeah. He is like a Scottish legend where he basically lived in a cave with all of his inbred children. Yep. And they would eat up they passers would eat by. the hell out of people, man. Yes. And then also, and I haven't forgotten about this because we're going to do it one day, a uh, Sonny Bean boat tour in Scotland. Remember? That was a thing you could do. Oh, yeah. We're going to do that one day. Definitely. I hope a fan works there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, probably at this point. I'm just point. like, like <laughs> maybe, just maybe. Then we can get like the VIB, <laughs> VIP Sonny Bean Yeah, treatment. the VIB Bean. VIB Bean. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, off season, which you read. Oh, yeah. Yep. I always mention it's one of the most disturbing things I've ever read, man. Dude, like in, like cannibal inbred families are always the most disturbing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hills of Eyes, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, not necessarily children in that, but it's the idea of like the inbred family. Leatherface is mentally. Developmentally a child kind of. Yeah. yeah, that's why he's my little, my little baby. Little boy. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. But all the, all these versions, so whether they are part of a, a cult, essentially, or they're a vampire or a zombie, or they are infected by a toxic cloud, they all have one thing in common, and that's that their motivation or reason that they exist makes them unsympathetic. And it, it lets us root for the protagonist to win, because you have to have a reason to root for the good guy, or else it's just weird to watch. Mm-hmm. That goes back to what we were talking about earlier. We're like... Evil kids make us feel weird. We have to have a reason as an audience to feel okay with what we're watching. To be, and to be like, yeah, kill that kid. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. To like have to like get the catharsis of them defeating the evil kid and feeling okay about it. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> we know our protagonist is ultimately going to have to resort to extreme measures to survive and we want to be like good with that (laughs) yeah spanking's not gonna cut it yeah but then at the same time and and this is what i found really interesting because i mentioned before i'm like ah, feral kids and i'm less in maybe into than like a possessed kid that's so much more glamorous (laughs) but this i think changed my mind a bit and i found this a really interesting reading feral kid movies hint at this kind of revenge story and who can kill a child again we're gonna talk a lot about this later it begins with documentation of wartime atrocities done to children it's literally clips of like hiroshima and like other catastrophic world events that affected shit yeah like that affected children with the numbers of children that were killed in it so it's this yeah it's like a fucked up montage of like here's what we've done to kids yeah children of the corn contains a lot of references to vietnam and it's significant that these kids all sacrifice themselves when they turn 19 which was the average age of the Amer- American boy going to Vietnam to fight. 19. 19, I think that's how, Yeah, I think that's how old my dad was when he went. That's... that's so okay, yeah, it is. It's a little... It's a child. Yeah. Yeah. So their religion and that story is influenced by the violence we ourselves as adults brought to Southeast Asia. So these undertones are kind of where this ambiguity I mentioned earlier comes in. Maybe this is all preventable if adults treat each other with civility. So both, you know, the feral kid, possessed kid, ultimately maybe not so evil. I think that's why breaking down those two types and noting that they are so prominent in the 70s is like really big. Okay. Yeah. We're moving into like ambiguous territory. 
So this kind of new ambiguous evil kids, a perfect way to go into the 80s. So the 70s leading up to the 80s is a really turbulent decade. Got the oil crisis, which we talk a lot more about in our Texas Chainsaw Massacre episode. Economy is really shitty. Got stagflation. Yeah, that Mm -hmm. weird ass term that. (laughs) Because what? It's like there's inflation, but everything still sucks. Yeah. (laughs) It is basically what stagflation is. A stagnating economy coupled with inflation. Right. Uh, volatile yeah. international relations. Iran We've hostage got, situation. Yeah, so yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Because yeah, this is this is Jimmy Carter. It's clear that the true problems of our nation are much deeper, deeper than gasoline lines or energy shortages, deeper even than inflation or recession. And I realize more than ever that as president, I need your help. And everyone's like, fuck you. Fuck you, peanut man. <laughs> you got beaten up by a rabbit. <laughs> what? Wait, what? He was in a boat and the rabbit jumped out of a like a the water onto him. Wait, what the and fuck? and then somehow a photographer caught it. And Are you serious? Yeah. He got beat oh. up by a rabbit in his little boat in like a creek or some God shit. God bless him. Yeah. He's going to cure guinea worm. <laughs> uh, didn't he already? Did he cure guinea? He, he like did that? Yeah. Just like check that off the list? Mm-hmm. Now he's building houses. Oh, yeah. With his black he just, eye. Yeah, I was going to say he just got back from getting like stitches and shit. He's mm-hmm. like, what, 95? 95. God bless him. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so the, the 80s creepy child and it's ambiguous evil. Now it's like explicitly ambiguous versus like you know, possessed kid, feral kid. We had to read into it a little bit to find the ambiguity there, but this is like a bit more open. Um, We kind of have the unsteadiness of this period being reflected here. There, these kids are ideologically confusing and they create confusing feelings. And the 80s also sees a big social shift regarding the kid. The 80s, return to family values we talk about this all the time but this is so important for this episode this like return to the family we got reagan coming in fuck you jimmy i'm coming in we're (laughs) gonna fix these kids and these families and we're taking your solar panels (laughs) off the white house roof (laughs) but this obviously impacts how we consider the role of kids and what childhood is meant to be So there's, again, a push. So we talked about the 1950s, nuclear family, 1980s. We want that nuclear family back. We want it to be stronger because the 70s is seeing that dissolve. Remember, we talked about the exorcist, and that's like a distant dad and this uninvolved mom who's at work and stuff. Like, no, no, no. The 80s is about fixing all of these problems. Mm -hmm. So we see... Con, you know, conversely to this idea, we're gonna we're gonna fix it all. We're seeing the still rising divorce rates, LGBT parents struggling for custody or otherwise the right to form their own families, increased economic independence for women. So, uh, mom and the Exorcist is still gonna go to work on her movie. <laughs> Overall, just big big shifts in family makeups. So then, horror in the '80s, we have this uh, also fixation with child abuse, child murder, other themes because the '80s on top of like being obsessed with bringing the family back together the 80s is when we get satanic panic Mm. and the daycare scandals and the daycare scandals okay so the daycare scandals the big one is mcmartin preschool and what may become one of the biggest child molesting cases ever on record seven nursery school teachers were arraigned today on more than 100 counts of child molestation the accused include the preschool owner 76 year old virginia mcmartin her daughter and two grandchildren is this like really fucked up case of like child abuse happening at a preschool in los angeles but then it kind of becomes like a wave of all of these cases involving daycare centers many of them just like panic it's like not real it's people panicking maybe after like this case and it just becomes this like frenzy i'm you know i i could be off in my explanation here because again this is like such a thing like i don't want to speak uh with total authority on the daycare scan like seriously it's like a big like yeah. satanic panic is like a whole thing too mm-hmm. but a lot of that you know maybe there's some like a, a nugget of truth to some of the things there but it's mostly frenzy okay yeah but it, it it's like this widespread panic over kids several types of panic over kids stranger danger we get in the 80s too 
that idea of like now we're more concerned about our kids interacting with strangers it's everyone becoming afraid of everyone pretty much but yeah so within like the the daycare scandals and the satanic panic that's where we get like false confessions drawn out of kids from these cases false memories it's like you ever heard like regression therapy where like someone is hypnotized and they remember traumatic but it's like they're just you're making stuff up yep i learned so much about how inaccurate that is that's what's happening with kids (laughs) at this time that's what a lot of satanic panic is is you have adults who are like expecting to hear a traumatic story from a kid so you have kids who are like being hypnotized and telling i'm not there was one involving like a uh, kid saying that they were captured from their daycare in a hot air balloon and like just like weird crazy shit because kids are just telling story they're like okay it's story time the adult wants me to tell them a weirdo story about daycare and i'm going to mm-hmm. but so among all this this frenzy and this debate over how we raise kids you know yeah the child is placed front and center and it's it all becomes about, like what's best for our kids and we still you know, use that kind of terminology today. And it's so much of the argument against like social progression too, because there's the fear that, oh, two dads are going to be bad for a kid. Like it's always, yes, that's what this is. Think of Helen Lovejoy. Yes. (laughs) Think of the children. Somebody please. Yeah. But as well as being at the center, ideologically, the kid is now a marketing demographic. The 80 sees a boom in marketing towards kids. Uh, I guess there's less restriction now on how and when advertising can be geared towards kids. I think there's like some loosening in like, uh, um, like standards on TV and stuff. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, and I thought this was interesting. The kids' purchasing power is so potent that we see it reflected in child's play. It's We have a broken family in that, single mom raising a kid, and a kid's buying power in that is so powerful that it brings in this negative force that affects the broken family. Yeah, she can't even afford that child's play doll. That's right. But that, that kid wants it so bad, she buys it out of an alleyway. That's right. And this brings us back to the to It's a Good Life, but now it's the 1983 version, which I also rewatched. And that's more like that, that like so heavily features consumer culture. The kids mm. obsessed with cartoons and junk food and even like the house in it himself. He changes to his whim and he uses things and stuff to get adults to stay in his life because he can just con- conjure shit out of thin air. So it just feels all a bit more materialistic. And I think it reflects like what, how we're seeing kids now. Please don't go, Helen. I can make it real nice here. I can make the food just the way you said it should be. I can even change the house. So yeah, the the kid becoming a a buying demographic, the empowerment of kids, kids being at the center of all of our dialogue. Um, it kind of disrupts the power of the dad and the family because previously the dialogue about families is it's not the dad. It's like father knows best. The family revolves around the dad. Children are meant to be seen, not heard. That kind of bullshit. These boys greet their dad as though they are genuinely glad to see him, as though they had really missed being away from him during the day and are anxious to talk to him. This is the time for pleasant discussion in a thoroughly relaxed mood. They don't pick this time of the day to spring unpleasant surprises on dad. Contrast like 80s creepy kids to our our 70s kids where we have like our possessed kids, our devil kids. The 80s we have like just weird kids, like ambiguous. They're not evil. We just have like a bunch of weirdo kids that are in horror. Oh, okay, sure. Because I'm seeing The Shining and Poltergeist. And I kind of think like uh, Carol Ann and Danny are are like almost conduits. Yes. As opposed to being the evil thing themselves. No, they're not. Like they're absolutely not. Yeah, they're more just like vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, channeling. Yeah, yeah. The the book, The Uncanny Child in Transnational Cinema, like she, she has such a good... Free. They are the uncanny child. They're not evil. Mm-hmm. They're weird. <laughs> like, they are unsettling. Danny from The Shining is creepy. Carol Ann is creepy. So that's what we're starting to get in the 80s. It's like way more ambiguous. Like we feel weird. We just feel weird about them. Yeah, <laughs> Something's okay. off. So these are, we're moving beyond the question of whether or not kids are born good or evil. We're just starting to explore the enigma of kids. Like, we're exploring what differentiates kids from adults and 
why those things that make kids different from adults are inherently creepy. They're naive. Their attempts at communicating are often weird. So that's why, you know, kids we like the stupid trope of the creepy kid drawing because it's a kid trying to communicate and it's off and it's you have to like interpret it like it's a fucking riddle, you know. <laughs> so this is now movies with adults trying to unlock these kids secrets. So The Shining, we have our our family. We have Wendy, Jack and Danny. Jack moves the family to the Overlook where he's going to be the off-season caretaker and he wants to restore unity to the family after very vague past events. The only thing we're kind of sure of is that he was an alcoholic and he abused Danny and dislocated his arm at some point. Yeah, by pulling him too hard. And when Wendy's telling the story to like the doctor who comes over to take care of Danny, she kind of like excuses it or like makes an excuse but then later jack complains to lloyd the bartender that like she'll never forgive him and then i it's also kind of weird unless i'm mistaken when wendy's telling the story she says that the incident made jack give up alcohol and that he hasn't had to drink in five months but then when jack's relaying the story to lloyd the bartender he's like it happened three fucking years ago so like was it five months ago was it three years ago like what's wendy's stance on it it's all so ambiguous and it's just that fucking movie man that just feeds yeah, into those conspiracy time means nothing in that movie <laughs> it's so weird yeah exactly but yeah like back at the beginning of this movie when everything seems simple and we, we see jack as like this guy who simultaneously he wants to fix his family and he wants to restore himself to the head of it being like a mentally stable emotionally stable patriarch good luck dude yeah we'll see about that and it's funny uh talking about like how the 80s kids have um there's a concern about television and maybe television raising kids and not having the quality time there is a line that's always stood out to me when they're driving to the overlook and they're talking about the donner party and danny's like that's okay i know about cannibalism i learned about it from tv see it's okay you saw it on the television danny though kind of upends this attempt at being normal because his powers unearth both his dad's traumatic subconscious and the hotels which we later realize are basically the same thing yeah yeah so the the kid is kind of represents this inability to go back to a previous family dynamic and inescapable trauma we look at the 80s and it's okay we're gonna try and go back to this this earlier version of the family where it's more stable and it's this very ideal like but you can't do that right okay. yeah exactly there's always going to be this inescapable shift and that's kind of what children represent maybe subconsciously to us yeah because they're the future exactly they, they as adults will not have your experience as right. an adult you can't keep saying children are the future while trying to push them back into this earlier mode of child rearing and like you know being a family and stuff there's consequences to that so his Danny's weirdness too also kind of plays with our difficulty as adults in trying to understand kids and this I think is interesting it's kind of reminiscent of Freud's cases with children which I took a Freud class in school and like that guy yeah man <laughs> the author of the uncanny child book refers to it as like hieroglyphics like it's just like trying to translate the kid symbols and stuff and that's mm -hmm. kind of what Danny is in The Shining we have like flashes of symbols it's like there's blood coming out of the elevator and there's creepy twins and red rum and Tony, his weird imaginary <laughs> friend who goes and hides in his stomach because he doesn't want to come out and see the doctor. Like <laughs> he's just all like creepy symbols. And that's what's so weird because it's often what kids are. <laughs> They're just like interpreting a puzzle box or something. Um, so that's why he's disturbing. He's not evil or possessed, but he is just like a normal kid. He's impenetrable. Yeah, he's like so other to being an adult. Kids are just so different mentally than adults are. And when we're adults, we like lose that. Yeah, yeah. I know. I think that's one of the things that makes Stephen King's story so uh, interesting and relatable is that he seems to have really been able to retain that sense of being yeah. a kid. Yeah, for sure. Carolyn and Poltergeist is another one of these kids too. And she doesn't even just represent like the dad's repressed trauma. Like Danny kind of is representing all this like repressed shit Jack's going on. And he makes like all of Jack's shit boil over in the end. He's like a Literally in the catalyst. Book. Yeah. <laughs> Lit boil? 
yeah, the hotel blows up because he doesn't tend to the <laughs> boiler room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the book, that fucking hotel blows up, man. Is that after all the the hedge animals come to life? That's oh, in the book, too. That is, yeah, the topiary animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but Caroline kind of represents, like, the whole family's fucked up inner selves because they're all one by one frightened by the thing that literally scares them in that movie we've got like the creepy clown doll and the tree outside and so the child also destabilizes secure adult identities one you literally see the paranormal investigator's face falling off in it so it's a very literal interpretation of the kid (laughs) destabilizing an adult self The kid, in this sense, also kind of disrupts the structure of the Reagan-era nuclear family. We see that the dad is sitting in bed reading Reagan, the man, the president, (laughs) if you wanted to be more literal about it. So we have Carol Ann is rescued because she gets like sucked into the beyond. But we so we rescue her and the house is cleared. (laughs) But resolution can never be that neat as it is in real life we can't just pretend like the kids are fine and that's it like something's always yeah there's a problem and we fix it and now it's back to normal and we're good yeah we can't pretend <laughs> kids aren't going to continue to be affected by things that happen to them the troubles revealed to be stemming right from their backyard because you son of a bitch you left the bodies and you only moved the headstones indian burial grounds <laughs> not the indian burial grounds. oh that's right yeah, we talk about in our Indian Burial Ground episode, uh, it's a little like, not Mandela effect, but like thing where people misremember that the graveyard in this is an Indian Burial Ground. It's not. It's just a regular? It's just a regular old burial ground. Just a white ass cemetery? Yes. <laughs> Under a white ass house. Reagan era <laughs> nuclear family house. So late 1980s, the creepy kid starts to give way to slashers. Although weirdly, I, I, I kind of just realized this too. Jason is kind of a creepy kid. Aww. He's a grown-up creepy kid. So is Michael, <laughs> even though that's 70s. But, you know, I think that's interesting. But, yeah. you know, the creepy kid trope we- is giving away to slasher movies. But we do see the creepy kid pop up again in the late 90s and early 2000s. And this time it's not just American creepy kids. Uh, kids are crucial to horror in Spain and Japan, especially at this time. Mm. So The Sixth Sense in 1999, The Devil's Backbone in 2001, and Ringu in 98, I think, are th- the three like biggins in okay. that era. The creepy kid is arguably the best thing at demonstrating that horror is pretty universal and that horror can be like a really uniting thing. And it doesn't always have to be the case that horror is separated by nationalities like countries everywhere are making horror films with creepy kids it's something that for something something in the water is like (laughs) making everyone make these movies at this time and we're um collaborating on them lots of co-productions at this time with other countries the others is a spanish american movie for one and uh, america's remaking a lot of j-horror at this time too we're remaking these creepy Japanese kid movies there's a lot of like trading back and forth and collaborating with this specific trope which I think is fascinating I never thought about it like that before yeah and the so this era of creepy kids demonstrates that um as we move into the new millennium we're all connected more so now than ever like we have this overarching global anxiety about childhood and children and it's gonna it reflects our changing ideas of what being a kid means at the turn of the 21st century like it's all just such a big shift which i think is really really cool and that's gonna be the end of part one because part two we're gonna talk about this like new millennium wave of horror and japanese horror spanish horror which oh boy (laughs) i'm excited i know i know a lot of people are too yeah we're not gonna talk all j horror we're not gonna talk it's, it's just gonna be you know creepy kids from new millennium so with ringu and juan the grudge and we'll talk a little about who can kill a child that's a little that's an older movie but um the orphanage we're going to talk about devil's backbone so if you want to watch those before we (laughs) that's the orphanage not the orphan not the orphan very different i always mix them up someone on twitter asked if i count uh esther from the orphan as a creepy kid you gotta i count her as a kid yeah i think because she you are led to believe she's a kid. Like she's coded as a kid. Mm -hmm. She counts as a kid. For me, it's kind of like, do you count 
Damien as a kid because technically he's the Antichrist. Sure. Like, no, he's a kid still. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's coded kid. He's creepy because he's a kid. Yeah, this the whole premise of the movie is based off the idea that she's a child. Do you, do you think there's any, can you think of any I left out that might have been uh, good to talk about? I'm sure there's, there's so many, because like there's a bajillion creepy kids. Every one that came to mind, we shortly got to after it bubbled up. Okay. Sonny Bean bubbled up there. Village mm-hmm. of the Damned, Children of the Corn, Child's Play. Mm-hmm. They're all in there. You mm-hmm. got them all. Cool. Mm-hmm. People will let me know ones I forgot. Oh, they'll let you know. <laughs> And it, there's a whole different aspect because I know that when you were doing research, you mentioned just a little bit about how like things are treated nowadays with kids and like stranger things. And are we going to get That's into that next, next episode? Week? Yeah. Okay. Cause I'd be interested to hear about that because I feel like those kids might be related to the kids of like monster squad where mm. it's like, you know, not creepy kids, but kind of horror Stephen King kids, Stephen King kids. Jesus. That could be its own episode. Oh yeah. <laughs> kids on bikes, <laughs> kids on bikes, yeah. ice cream, man, get in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Cool. So that's that next that's part week part one, yeah. two anything uh you need to say to wrap this one out uh follow dead me on social media at dead me james on twitter and instagram and get that dead me collector's edition of in search of darkness the 80s horror documentary yeah only available to pre-order in october mm-hmm. come november 1st your chances are gone. Yeah. We're also going to be at ScareCon later this month, so check out ScareCon. We'll be there Friday and Saturday Friday only. Friday and Saturday. Something came up. We can't do Sunday. We're sorry. Yeah. But we're going to do panels, a live screening of a movie that we're just going to talk over. Yep. <laughs> it's going to be fun, so check that out, too. I'll put links in the description. But, yeah. Uh, until then. I'm James. And I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Me Podcast. Oh, wait. I'm C-R-E-V-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, Yeah, do that. Uh, bye. <laughs> <laughs>